Well, hello and welcome to Faith, Philosophy and Life. Me and Mr. Shelton, it's great to see you and I do hope that you are doing well. Today what we're going to do is we're going to be thinking a little bit about the Trinity, something totally different than the good and evil topics that we've been talking about where we talk about suffering and the problem of evil. Today we're going to be thinking about a hugely theological concept which is about the Trinity. Now I've got a clip here, I don't know if it's going to play, it's from the classic film Bruce Almighty. I like to think while you watch this, what's God like in this clip? So let's watch this now, what's God like? You're looking for room seven. Yeah, I figured. <laughs> you want me to even those up for you? <laughs> How do I get to room seven? I'll be on the seventh floor. Stairs right over there. I'd rather take the elevator. Out of order. I love the stairs, though. They were my second choice. Do you mind giving me a hand with this floor? What? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Are you serious? Oh, uh, I'm kind of busy. Um, rain check. I hold you to it. I'm free on the seventh. That's seven. Seventh. That's seven. It is. <sighs> this looks promising. Hello. Another gigantic, ginormic waste of my life. Hello? Yo, I'm looking for whoever runs this joint. Be right with you. I'm trying to fix a light. Tell me if it's working. Yeah, seems to be. Kind of bright, though. Yeah, it is for most people. Spend their lives in the dark trying to hide from me. Well, the elevator's broken, huh? Yeah, but I'll get around to it. You install the clapper? No, but catch a jingle, isn't it? <laughs> clap on, clap off, clap on, clap on, the clapper. <laughs> Just can't get it out of my head, Ed. Well, good luck with that. I'm gonna go now. Okay, but the boss will be right out. Well, you must be Bruce. I've been expecting you. This is hilarious. So you're the boss and the electrician in the janitor. Must be a killer Christmas party. <laughs> Don't get drunk, though. One of you might need a ride home. <laughs> <laughs> you always were funny, Bruce. Just like your father. He didn't mind rolling up his sleeves either, son. People underestimate the benefit of good old manual labor. It's freedom in it. Some of the happiest people in the world go home smelling to high heaven at the end of the day. All right, what is this? How do you know my father, and how do you get my pager number? Oh, I know quite a lot about you, Bruce. Just about everything there is to know. Everything you've ever said, or done, or thought about doing. Right there in that file cabinet. Wow, a whole drawer just for me. Yeah. Mind if I take a look? It's your life. That sounded be good. Last entry was a little disturbing. The gloves are off, God. God has taken my bird and my bush. God is a mean kid with a magnifying glass. Smite me, almighty smiter. Now, I'm not much for blaspheming, but that last one made me laugh. Are you spying on me? Who are you? I'm the one. Huh? Creator of the heavens and the earth. Alpha and Omega. Oh, I see where this is going. Bruce? 
I'm God. Bingo! Yahtzee! Is that your final answer? Our survey says God! Bing, 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 bing! Well, it was nice to meet you, God. Thank you for the Grand Canyon, and good luck with the apocalypse. Oh, and by the way, you suck! You know what would have been a little bit more impressive, though? If you hadn't used the cheesy file cabinet illusion. Anybody with a brain stem can tell that that drawer is being fed through the wall from the other side. All you have to do is find the crease right around here. There is a seam here, or a hollow spot. Where? Through the drywall and concrete? Okay, that is a good one. That is a good one. Okay, how many fingers am I holding up? Now, Bruce, thou shalt not tempt the Lord. Hey, if you can't God. do it, man, that's cool. Three, two, four, nine, six, eight, one. Okay. How many now? Seven. Aha! <laughs> You've been doing a lot of complaining about me, Bruce. Quite frankly, I'm tired of it. Wait, 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 wait. Don't come near me. Seriously, when I'm backed into a corner, I'm like a wild animal. I don't want to hurt you, but I will out of instinct. You haven't won a fight since grade five, and that was against a girl. Yeah, she was huge. She'd been held back. And the sun was in your eyes. Oh, there you go. In a way, I brought you here to offer you a job. A job? What job? My job. You think you can do it better, so here's your chance. When you leave this building, you will be endowed with all my powers. Sure. Whatever you say, Bill. Okay. That did not happen. And no one needs to hear about it. I'm deleting the program. <laughs> no. No. So, with that, and you thinking about the concept of the way that God might relate to people and people might relate to God, we're going to get our title down in a minute, but here's our cheesy intro sequence. So our title today is what is the trinity and the oneness of god what's the trinity and the oneness of god and we're going to understand what god is like for christians um we've done things similar to this before so some of this isn't going to be new to you it's going to be good if you can state the meaning of god it's going to be great if you can give an explanation of the trinity and even better if you can suggest reasons why christians view god as three distinguished parts of one god this is a complicated one this is very theological um, that means it's very centered in doctrine and teaching. Um, I don't expect that you're going to fully understand when, when, when we finished our time together. I certainly don't fully understand it. I've been thinking about this for whew, hundreds of years uh, and so has the church. So we're going to watch some media clips. We've got definitions. We're going to look at the Trinity and then we're going to look at existence and reasons for existence of God as well. So we're covering quite a lot. So to start off with, what do we understand by the term God? So I've got some information on the screen there. I'd like you to create your own definition of the word God um, using some of that information there to help you. So pause me when you're done or unpause me when you're done and we'll carry on. Okay, so the next thing then is there's a worksheet um, which I'd like you to access that's in the description below. And if you can't find the worksheet, hey, you can just smile and watch this clip. Um, I've got this clip for you to watch. It explains what the Trinity is, does it very, very, very well in my opinion. And uh, I'd like to make some notes while it's on. 
Uh, if you use the worksheet, that's great. And if you don't want to use the worksheet, then just make some notes what the Trinity is. And let's watch this now. The Absolute Basics of the Christian Faith Question 1. Who is God? The Trinity is one of the most important theological ideas ever, but it gives people panic attacks when they think about it. So this talk will give you the very basics of what you need to understand what the Trinity is and why it matters so much. The key idea behind the Trinity is this. God is three things, but also still one thing. God is three persons who have existed for all eternity, equally powerful, wise, and good, and they've always depended on each other. There's the Father, the Son, and the Spirit existing together in perfect harmony as one God. So how can this be? How can you have three things that exist perfectly together? It's a bit of a head-scratcher, but here's the thing. If you can understand a tiny bit about how music works, you can understand the basics of the Trinity. So find a piano uh, and pick any white key and put your thumb down on it. Then skip a white key and put your index finger on the next one. Then skip one more and put your middle finger on the next white key. Now press down your thumb, then your index finger, then your middle finger, and boom, there's a harmonic chord. There are three distinct sounds that all exist together in perfect harmony. Three things that are also one thing. The threeness and oneness here work together perfectly. This gives us a bit of a picture, uh, more accurately, a sound of what God is like. There's one God, like the one chord, with three persons, like the three notes, all existing in perfect harmony forever. Now, unlike the chord that you might have played, which came into being and then ceased to exist, the three persons of the Trinity have always existed. They've always existed in a relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father has always been Father to the Son. In fact, you can't be a Father without a Son. The Son has always been Son to the Father, and they've always been unified in love of the Spirit. What this means is that the most basic fact about all reality is loving relationship. Before there was a world, there was a family, the family of the triune God. So when you get into the very bottom of things, the root of all reality, there's love. C.S. Lewis, in his book Mere Christianity, makes a very interesting point out of this. He writes, all sorts of people are fond of repeating the Christian statement that God is love. But they seem not to notice that the words God is love has no real meaning unless God contains at least two persons. Love is something that one person has for another person. If God was a single person, then before the world was made, he was not love. So the fact that God is perfectly loving requires that God is relational. And But the opposite is also true. The fact that God is relational requires that God is perfectly loving, and here's why. If God is triune, then we know that God is love, um, because you can't have three people existing for all eternity in harmonious relationship if they aren't perfectly loving. Imagine, for instance, existing for all eternity with your brothers and sisters, or even with your friends. Eventually you get in some fights. But the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity, they don't fight. We know, therefore, that God is love because God is triune, and we know that God is triune because God is love. So the Trinity is this perfect loving relationship that's always existed, one God and three persons. And because the Trinity is one God, the persons work together in everything they do. In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus says that we are to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because the entire Trinity is at work in everything God does and at work in saving us, the whole Trinity has to be named as we are made part of Christ's body through baptism. But it's not just baptism. All throughout the story of Jesus, we see all three persons of the Trinity at work. There's a pattern. The pattern is this. The Father is the source of everything, and he sends the Son into the world in the power of the Spirit. We see this, for instance, in Jesus' birth in Luke chapter 1. By the Holy Spirit, the Son of God is born into the world. The Father sends the Son in the power of the Spirit. We also see this in Jesus' baptism. The Son is carries out the mission of the Father in the power of the Spirit. Jesus goes down in the water and ascends, and the Father proclaims his approval of the Son, and the Spirit ascends and sends Jesus out into the wilderness and on into ministry. We see this also in Jesus' blessing of his disciples when he ascends. When the Son goes back to the Father, he sends the Spirit to empower us. So we see this in the birth, and the baptism, and the blessing of Jesus. We see this all throughout. The Father is the source and goal of our salvation. Jesus is the way back to the Father, and the Holy Spirit is the power to get there. If you want, you can imagine it a bit like this. The Father is the one who says, let there be light. The Son is the one who goes and flips on the light switch. The Spirit is the electricity that powers the light bulb. The Father is the source, the Son is the way, the Holy Spirit is the power. 
Another way you might want to think about this, if you're still trying to get your head around the Trinity, is to imagine yourself kneeling and praying the Lord's Prayer. We're praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Imagine yourself kneeling and praying the prayer. Now imagine Jesus standing beside you, teaching you to pray. We begin by praying, though, our Father, just like Jesus prayed. And so Jesus is helping us to have right relationship with the Father. Now imagine that the Holy Spirit is inside you, which he is, giving you the power to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Jesus is beside you, the Father is above you, the Spirit's inside you, all working to give us right relationship with God. Father's the source, Jesus is the way, Holy Spirit is the power. Now all this might seem a little bit mysterious and complicated, but the nice thing is that once you start looking for the Trinity, once you understand it a little bit, you see it everywhere. So for instance, the very words of the Apostles' Creed, we see that they are shaped by the Trinity. We begin with the Father, we move to the Son, and then we end with the Spirit and the Spirit's area of work, which is empowering the church. Father above you, Jesus beside you, Spirit inside you, there you go, there's the Trinity. So we said we could understand what the meaning of God is. Hopefully we've got that definition. Great if you could explain the Trinity. Now, I'm sure we can't box that off fully yet, but we're probably working on it. The exam board do require you to be aware of two passages, which is from John chapter 1 and Philippians chapter 2. One's called the prologue, one's called the kenosis. Um, So John chapter 1, the prologue, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Substitute the Word for Jesus. And then you've got in the beginning with Jesus, Jesus was with God and Jesus was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. And Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us, incarnation, Christmas. And we've seen his glory, glory as the one and only son of the father, full of grace and truth. So lots of theology in there, maybe worth making a note of the key ideas. And then we'll look at the the kenosis as well. Having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of man, he found himself in a human form. He humbled himself to becoming obedient even to the death on a cross. Again, some ideas there about the Trinity. I always like doing this in class. Imagine a ball of Play-Doh, divide that into three, or a piece of blue tack, divide it into three. The substance is identical in all three balls, but all three balls are independent from each other. And that is really what the Trinity is like. It's this idea that it is one thing, divided into three parts. It's exactly the same substance, it's exactly the same thing. Now you say, Mr. Shelton, that's very confusing. Well, it is confusing. All you need to know for your exam is that the exam board specified that the Trinity is one God in three parts, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not the Father, and the Holy Spirit is not the Son. And you've got the idea. But they're all the same substance, they're all the same thing. So, Make sure you've got a definition of the Trinity down. And then you also need to know what Augustine said about it. And this comes from the idea that God is love. Love needs three things. It needs the person to do the loving, the person being loved, and the love itself. So they say, uh, Augustine says, that is basically what it is all to do with. The Trinity is about God being in love. In fact, as we saw in our clip earlier, You can't have relationship unless God himself is in relationship. And God can only be in relationship with himself in terms of a perfect entity, uh, hence why he opens us up to be part of that relationship too. So make sure you've got written down what Augustine said, make sure you've got the reference of the Trinitate, and uh, that will give you the main information of love, lover, and beloved. Again, exam board hints. So, We've thought about what God is. We've looked at the Trinity and 
now we're starting to think about God being distinguished as one God in three parts. We need to look at arguments for and against God's existence as well at this point. Um, some of you may have covered this previously in the course. But what I'd like you to do is to um, do a little table. Uh, using the description below, you will find information sheets that look something like that. And uh, I would like you to come up with arguments for and against God's existence um, that people might use. And if you're struggling with some, just do some Googles. Get some information up there. There's loads of stuff out there on this particular topic. And then come back to me when you're done. Brilliant. So what we've done, just wrapping up now, is we have um, gone through all this information. We've got all of this down. We've met our objectives, which is superb. And uh, now we're going to do a little plenary last activity. So this is the answer. I'd like you to make a question up, please. What question would be lead to the answer of God? Got four of these. So that's number one. The next one is Trinity. What answer would lead? Now that's the answer. What question would lead to the answer of Trinity? The next one, the Holy Spirit, that's the answer. What question would lead to the answer of the Holy Spirit? And lastly, Jesus. Jesus. I know you might say all well, answers in RE least Jesus, but that's not actually true. But let's not go there, or else I might end up telling you a joke about a squirrel, and you really don't want to be hearing that. So I'm going to leave it there for the day. Thanks very much for your time. Please photograph everything, send it through to your teachers. Good work today. Um, take care of yourself, stay safe, wash hands, God bless you. I'll be seeing you soon.